Amen. Thank you so much. Music team, so fun to hear uh, all of you uh, singing. And, um, and you know, I guess maybe you know you're in for it when, you know, when somebody says, we look forward to the Lord cutting us to the quick. So, so, <laughs> so we're, we've uh, girded, up our, girded up our loins here in preparation uh, as, uh, as, and for the preaching here this morning. William Franklin, uh, Franklin Graham Jr., better known as Billy Graham, was born on November 7th, 1918, and passed away just nine months shy of his 100th birthday. Many of you will remember that in uh, 2018. Uh, like most highly influential people, Mr. Graham gets a lot of high praise, and he gets plenty of low criticism uh, as well. But one of those who dearly loved and knew Mr. Graham is Pastor Greg Laurie. Uh, Pastor Laurie has uh, uh, been a very influential uh, man himself. He started uh, Harvest Crusades, uh, which holds these large-scale, kind of Billy Graham-style evangelistic crusades all throughout our country. Uh, All the while, he continues to pastor Harvest Christian Fellowship, which is now a Southern Baptist church in Riverside, California. Uh, Pastor Lori published the book, The Man I Knew, in 2021 uh, to memorialize his friend um, Billy Graham. In addition to his uh, personal relationship with him, Pastor Lori often blogs on his website, uh, giving us little details about uh, Billy Graham's life. Uh, One often told story Pastor Greg shared about Billy and his wife, Ruth, occurred during the taking up of a church offering. It was there, maybe some of you have heard this, uh, it was there that Billy uh, learned a lesson about our titled sermon this morning, Giving Righteously. It is said that as uh, as the offering was being taken, Billy reached into his pocket, uh, meaning to grab a $5 bill. Instead, he pulled out a 50 and didn't uh, really discover it until he had placed it in the offering plate. Billy admitted that he was a little horrified uh, at what he had done and leaned over to his wife, Ruth, and said, well, at least I will get a reward in heaven for $50. Ruth, being the wonderful wife that she was, said, no, you're going to get a reward for $5 because that's all you meant to give. (laughs) Well, thank God for our wives, right, men? Uh, reminding us uh, of the truths of the Scripture. If you're joining Capital City Church uh, this morning, uh, we are preaching through the life of Christ. And if you can't tell by the theme of, uh, of the psalm this morning and, and by the introduction, uh, we are preaching on something that we don't often preach on, and that is giving. That is the, the, the blessing of giving uh, this morning. And we are in that uh, monumental moment in the ministry of Jesus where he delivers uh, what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, remember that Jesus has just finished explaining what true righteous theology and living, uh, and living look like in chapter 5 through uh, verse 20 through 48, where we spent a number of weeks working our way through. And let us not forget that pursuing righteousness and righteous living as a Christ follower is not Uh, an option, but rather expected everywhere in the New Testament. And starting in chapter 6, verse 1, our sermon last week, uh, Jesus gives his disciples a grave warning, right, about the pursuit of righteous living. Effectively, right, after he has described what righteous living looks like, um, he he goes on to to say, beware, right? And we we spent much time in grammar last week just thinking through the idea that that the word beware there in the text is it's uh, it's an imperative, right? It it means to get our intention. And if we were Greek readers or good ones anyway, we would recognize the imperative mood of his warning. Beware, uh, Jesus says of this. While you're living righteously, effectively, beware of hypocrisy and why it trades divine rewards for personal glory. It trades divine rewards for personal glory. This was a lesson that Ruth Graham <laughs> had to remind Billy of, right? When he remorsefully, uh, for giving God too much money, 
uh, uh, he acted remorsefully, right, for giving God too much money in the offering. And so, so we need to beware of that hypocrisy, and, and that's what Jesus is after now, expecting that a Christ follower will follow him in all righteousness. So after the warning Jesus gave in 6.1, and we preached through that last week, and if you'd like to catch that, you can always go online and do that. But we're going to take off from verse 2 this week. Uh, and, and as we move our way forward, Jesus then gives us three examples of righteous, uh, righteous acts. Uh, we will look at giving today, Lord willing, praying next week. And finally, in this third week, we'll, we'll look at fasting. Uh, each example is not meant... to to be the only areas in which the Christian will be tempted to lose eternal reward. Uh, The principle, and that's why I wanted to to, to really split that out last week and just talk about the principle here of of doing things to get a reward uh, from men or to look good to, to other people. And so that exists well outside of giving, praying, and fasting. Uh, And so uh, we, we understand that what Jesus was teaching here uh, is doing righteous acts before others to be noticed or honored by them always results in the loss of divine rewards. That's what we need to keep in mind. That's what each one of these sermons, whether we're talking about giving, right, or we're talking about praying, or we're talking about fasting, the idea is that uh, you're going to be tempted to make yourself look good in these areas. Don't do it, because However you have made yourself look good or not, that's the only reward that you're going to get. And so it's a little repetitive uh, that what we're going to go over today, but I want us to, to lean in and, and uh, uh, think our way through uh, what all of these things look like. So if you're visiting today, we're preaching on giving, and I, I couldn't help but notice uh, lots of visitors, and, and, and there's a few things you, you, know, you, you just you kind of dread a little bit when you, when, when you, as a preacher, right? Like everybody uh, has been taken advantage of in some way or shape or form in, in, the, uh, in giving or somebody has struggled with, through when we came up a few weeks ago on divorce and, and remarriage. Like I'm not just jumping up and down downstairs in my study thinking, man, is this going to be a fun sermon to preach, right? Uh, so you're always kind of just a little hesitant, but yet this is what we do at Capital City Church. We, we don't pick out themes and, and preach on what we want to preach whenever we want to preach on it, although there is a time and a place for that. We work through the text, and why do we do that? So that you, that God's people, that me, as, as his servant, as a, as a preacher, is not just preaching the fun stuff and the stuff we want to talk about, but, but we hit the difficult topics, and we don't pass by them. They're all in the text for us to learn from, and we need to learn from them. Amen? And so this morning, if you're visiting, uh, you know, we're not preaching on giving because uh, that's what our church always preaches on. Uh, we just preach on it when it comes uh, to, to, uh, to us here in the text. And today, uh, we're going to be learning that giving righteously uh, yields divine rewards. So take a look with me at Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 2 through 4, where Jesus says, So when you give. I want to pause here uh, for... Uh, just a moment and recognize that Jesus is always keeping it real. Uh, I often point this out, but you might underline the you there in your Bible and, and, and recognize that we don't, we don't have this in English unless you live in the South, and we certainly don't write it down in English. But, but here, that is not a plural you uh, that Jesus is, is, even though he's speaking to a crowd, probably much like I am speaking to y'all this morning, uh, he, he goes ahead and he tightens it up and, 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 and he, he, he says, when you, singular, give. And so um, it's, it's, it's good for us to recognize this morning that, he, that he's changing that. Um, and as if we were sitting and listening to Jesus preach this sermon, he is not kind of looking out general and saying, when you all give, right? That it's more like uh, he looks right down at Valerie and he says, Valerie, when you give. Right? It's very personal uh, what Jesus is doing there. But let's not forget who Jesus is speaking to. That personal you is a disciple, one who has dedicated their life to following Jesus. And, and I think it's really important that we recognize that. And maybe you say, well, Pastor, we're all at church. We need that. You don't need to talk. But how many times, and we, we learned this a few weeks ago as we look back at the He Gets Us campaign. 
uh, on, on, that happened during the Super Bowl, and, and we can all recognize that the teachings of Jesus, the ethical teachings of Jesus, if everybody would apply them, the world would be a better place. But Jesus didn't come to make the world a better place. He came to save sinners. He came to call sinners to repentance, right? And so to just teach what Jesus says, and if you just read yourself into the text and you're not a believer, well, great, you know, uh, here in this particular case, uh, you would give or you would spend your life giving and maybe giving to the poor, but if you missed eternity, none of it will matter. The whole idea here is that you get an eternal reward and the you is a born-again Christian. And although... Many people in our nation identify as Christians. There are very few who are authentic. In other words, uh, there are many counterfeit Christians in our nation. And beloved, while we interact with them, we can always be ready to love them by asking a couple of, uh, a couple of questions. Like, when were you born again? I'll never forget, uh, uh, we had a, a, a couple that, you know, God's great providence to my wife and I, we didn't grow up in the church and and we, our very first home that we bought together was right next door to a Christian couple who shared the Lord with us. We got saved uh, at that point in time. But I, but I, and, and we we're just learning and growing as fast as we could learn and grow. We couldn't get enough of, uh, of just this life that God had given us. And but I'll never forget a story that she had told, and and that she was interacting with a. Uh, I, th- I can't remember if it, it seemed like it was one of the mainline denominations, uh, a person that was in her workplace. Uh, that would often uh, uh, claim to be a Christian, but always act very unchristian. And so one time uh, she had the opportunity to, to, to ask the lady, were, when were you born again? And I remember uh, that the response was that the lady just looked with a blank stare. Well, I got catechized. I, you know, I went through my catechism. I did the thing. I got baptized right. But, but there was a an emptiness when it came to answering the question, when were you born again? When were you born again? We might ask that question. How are you worshiping? Are you you worshiping weekly in spirit and truth, we might ask? Or or do you joyfully obey the teachings of Jesus? Are they grudging to you? It's just another rule to follow. And if we get that blank stare and answer, no, likely they are not genuine Christians and we know to start over and we know to talk about sin and to recognize and turn from it and, and that the Spirit of God will come in and, and make them a new creation, 2 Corinthians. But in our context here, verse 2, there is no promise of eternal reward for those who do not belong to God. Not because God is not gracious to his children, but because so many who claim to be his children in our nation specifically are not. Now listen, if you go into a a country that is very violent towards Christianity, you don't find the dynamic that we have in America, right? You don't fake being a Christian because it's probably going to cost you your life, right? But in America, we can kind of fake along, right? Wander along, say all the right things. Do all the right things, yet not be born again. Remember that Jesus was forever warning religious people who were deceived about their eternal destination. He would call them children of the devil. Now, that's how you make friends, right? You're having a debate, and they think they're a a child of God, and he looks you in the eye and says, no, you're a child of the devil. I don't care that you come to church every Sunday. You're not born again. How did he determine who was who? By simply asking them to look in the mirror, consider, have have I really been born again? Is there a new nature inside of me? Am I really worshiping in spirit and truth? Can Can I not wait to get to Sunday to corporately worship with the saints and have the Spirit of God do what Rex just said just a, a few moments ago? Cut me to the quick, right? How weird is that, right? I want to feel bad for my sin, That's what a spirit-filled person does, right? Everybody else thinks you're a nutcase, right? Are you born again? Are you worshiping in spirit and truth? Or are you joyfully, I say that as we we considered last week, uh, uh, 1 1 John 5, 3, right? That, That we would joyfully be doing the things of the Lord, not begrudgingly because we have to. Is that 
Is that your experience? Your friends, if you cannot answer yes to every one of those promptings, none of what I'm going to teach today will matter to you. First, you'll need to confess your sin and cry out to the Lord for salvation. Right? Then you could be a disciple who will one day receive an eternal reward. So it is when Jesus says, so when you give, he is speaking directly of sold out, born again followers. And he has he is narrowed it down to the single person in the singular. When you do this. Notice, Jesus does not say if you give, but rather when you give. As I mentioned a moment ago, a genuine spirit-filled Christian will be joyfully doing what Christ has commanded. That is why Jesus says, when you give, right here in, in, in verse 2. And then here uh, uh, next week, it's going to be when you pray in verse 5. And then it, when we get on down to verse 16, it's whenever or when you fast, right? It's, it's not if you do these things, right? It's, it's when you do these things. And, and it's not ever because we have to do these things. It's we get to do these things, and the Spirit of God inside of us prompts us to do these things, and, and we do it joyfully out of, out of a desire for obedience, yes, but not in the sense that you broke the rule, right? But I get to worship. I get to give. I get to pray. I get to fast. Everybody say amen, right? <laughs> Especially on the fasting, right? I can't wait. Love it. The expectation of a Christian or a Christian uh, or a Christ following disciple sitting at the Sermon on the Mount or for that matter listening today is that they will be in this case giving. Before we get into the specifics of giving to the poor, uh, I, I'll confess to you that I, that I want to spend some time and talk about what it means to give in the New Testament church. So we'll get to the to the poor and 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 it has already, in some ways, been preached last week, and, and we understand the principle. But I want to pause and, 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 and lean in here on when we give and, and what it means um, uh, to be a giver in the New Testament. And why? Because all of our giving, regardless of its destination, is governed by the need to give righteously or lose a reward. So, so although we're going to we're going to get to giving to the poor, right? The, the principle that we are learning here is that if I give the wrong way in any setting, I will have lost my reward. As far as the New Testament is concerned, there are only two kinds of giving uh, to be found in it. There is giving to the church and giving to the poor. Uh, whether or not the individual Christian should exercise liberty uh, to give to parachurch, lobbyists, or even mission organizations independently here, is what I'm saying, of their local church, the Bible has nothing to say about that. There's, there's just nothing to say about it. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's wrong. I don't know that it means it's right. But we have no way to govern it. We have nothing to come back to. What, this, what the Word of God teaches is give to the church and give to the poor. <laughs> That's what we know, all right? Now, the New Testament pattern is that people gave weekly to their local church, which had biblically qualified leadership, and then that leadership distributed the funds. Case in point, if you and I were uh, in the Philippian church of the first century, uh, the elders and deacons, that is the God-inspired right church governance, uh, they're, they're the ones that God has set over the church to manage all things or oversee all things in the church, um, uh, uh, they are spiritually and they are ethically qualified. And uh, they, are, they would have been the ones responsible, right, for the oversight and the distribution of the weekly offering. Uh, they would have determined and they would have set aside uh, how much was going to missions, just like we would do here at Capital City Church. Their missionary uh, in Philippians and in this first century church, as we know, was, uh, was the Apostle Paul. Then the elders of that Philippian church, through Epaphroditus, likely a deacon in that setting, sent the gift to the missionary, right? That's the pattern. So first, we think about giving, when we think about giving in general, uh, we, we see the pattern. The 
People came to church, they gave, the, the people who were qualified to oversee that giving and distribute that giving uh, is all explained for us in the New Testament. But let's lean in just a little bit more and, and let's just ask the questions that we should always be asking of the text. Uh, when we think about giving, let's answer who, what, where, when, why, and how we should give. We've already answered the who. We know Jesus uh, is referring to those who follow him uh, when he says, when you give. The second question is what you give as a believer. And we do not have to wrestle too hard to answer that question, right? The context here is giving to the poor. And what do most people have if they are not poor? Simple, Simple question. If you're not poor, you have money, (laughs) right? And so we don't have to do a lot of exegesis here. We don't have to do a word study or anything else, right? The the context drives that that what we give when we come to the church is money. There you go. All right. Uh, Thanks for all your help there, right? It's it's not too hard, right? And uh, not that we wouldn't be helpful to volunteer some of our time or efforts to those who are impoverished, uh, I'm sure it would be uh, a, a huge blessing, right? But, but what Christians are to give is money. Uh, we now know that who, the who, right, are the Christians, and the what is money. The next two questions are where and when should Christians give. First, let's talk about where, where we give. And uh, to get there, and you might turn here if you want, we're going to be uh, spending some time uh, in, in, in a text here, back and forth in, in First and Second Corinthians and Romans. I don't know. I'll have it up on here on the screen. Lord willing, I will. Sometimes I forget to put it in. And then I say that, and the people in the back are like, no, you don't, you don't have it in. Uh, and then they look bad, and, and I don't. But it's really my fault. So anyway, back to it, right? Uh, so we're going to be in First Corinthians 16. We're going to be in Second Corinthians 9. Uh, but right now, uh, just by way of kind of setting the stage, where do we give, right? If you could just, if you could just kind of erase all your thinking about where uh, to give and, and just say, okay, well, I'm just reading my Bible. I want to know where to give. I know I'm a Christian and I know I'm supposed to give money. Uh, where should I do that? Well, Romans 15, 25 through 26, uh, Paul is writing to that Roman church, uh, wanting to get back to them. But first he's got to go to Jerusalem And he says in verse 25, I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints for Macedonia and Achaia. So these are the churches of Thessalonica. This is Philippi. All these are in Macedonia. Achaia is more down towards uh, the uh, Corinth and all that. Um, But anyway, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased. I think that's such an important thing. You might just pause. And if you've turned there, you can underline that. What, how, how is it that they were giving? begrudgingly, oh, we have to, or we have to do what the apostle says. No, they have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Now, uh, I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but, but just know this, uh, the Jerusalem church, right after Jesus is, has died and buried and resurrected and, and everything is developing, it's the very first megachurch, right? Peter, Peter preaches his first message, 3,000 people get saved, right? And, and by the time you're in Acts 6, you've got thousands of, of, of people and lots of issues that are going on, right, uh, inside the church. And most of those issues are due to the fact that people are being kicked out of the synagogue, uh, which is the, it's kind of the hub, it's the lifeblood of, uh, of all believers. And, and to lose the synagogue implies this, that you that you've lost your family. And if you've lost your family in that culture, you've lost your retirement. And if you've lost your retirement in that culture, you've lost your home, right? Because everybody worked at home. They, they, built a house, they built a room on their father's house. They took over the family business. Well, when you got kicked out, when you left your faith, you, you didn't have anything. And you got thousands of people who are impoverished, right? Not making money, not, not, uh, not able to sustain themselves. And so this is a massive problem in the early church. And so as Paul is preaching and he's going through all of what is now uh, Turkey and Asia and, and moving his way over to Rome, he's, he's telling every single local church, set aside some money. We have got to help this church that really birthed everything, right? They're in bad shape. As a matter of fact, I can't think of another 
another situation or another city where, where thousands and thousands were being saved like Jerusalem was. So anyway, they made a contribution for the poor among the saints. Now let's notice Paul's instruction to one of the churches in Achaia, that is the Corinthian church. It answers both where and when a Christian should give. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 or 2, Paul said, Now, concerning the collection for the saints, this is the collection he's been talking about. He's been getting ready, right? He's written Rome about. This is the collection that's going on. As I directed the churches of Galatia. Now, I want to pause uh, for just a second. And and, and, and if you're in the theological no uh, or not, I I want you to understand. And if you've turned to 1 Corinthians 16, like I had mentioned to you, you, you might uh, underline church, churches, plural, there, and, and write uh, right over in your, your column, like this is multiple churches, multiple churches. Now you're saying, Carl, so what? <laughs> my, my, point, my point is this, is that each local church was asked to do this. There wasn't some kind of Episcopalian style government that, that, was, that Paul, the Apostle Paul was over all these churches and there wasn't some kind of uh, uh, maybe a supersession or, 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 or covenant style of, uh, of, of understanding of the church is now Israel, right? No, here, here, here we have a, have a really clue, a good clue here that, that Paul is talking to individual local churches, right? Each one has its own elders, right? He could have just said, as I directed the whole church of Galatia or the whole church in all of the world, but he didn't, right? There's a little note here, a little understanding of how the early church developed. I directed the churches, plural, of Galatia. So do you also, Paul says, it's kind of a weird, uh, almost sounds more King Jamesy, even in the NASB here. And that word do right there, again, back to it is, is it's an imperative uh, not really, it's, it's, a, it's a command. Do this. You do what they have done also, Corinthian church, on the first day of every week, each one of y'all, that is a plural you there, is to put aside and save as he may prosper. As he may prosper. Beloved, notice again here that the question is not if you give, but rather when you give. And the answer to the question of where and when uh, uh, we should uh, give is found here in the reference, the first day, right? That's our Sunday, right? That's the first day of the week. I know us Americans, we, we think it's the last day of the week, right? Because it's a day off or whatever, but this is the first day of the week, and uh, our calendars recognize that, do they not, when we look at them? Uh, on the first day of every week. So the first day of every week, Sunday, or better said, the Lord's Day or Resurrection Day, that day where and when Christians assemble for worship. So where do we give? At church. When do we give? Every week. The next question is, why give? And the answer to this question is quite shocking. Uh, I really had to work through some things here, and I'm, I'm already running out of time, I can tell. I wish I could wax a little more eloquent about uh, some of those things, but I can't. But uh, I'll say that I, uh, I did appreciate Pastor MacArthur's insights about giving from this particular text. Uh, his answer to why give is correct, and it's biblical as usual. The beneficiary of giving, listen here, is us. It's not God. It's us. Why give? It is a blessing to the giver, both in the present, right, as we're going to see here with the poor, and, and in eternity, Have you ever slowed down to think about giving and realize that God doesn't need our money? You're just pause for a second. God doesn't need our money. Uh, As Pastor John noted, uh, the the Lord is not sitting up in heaven, right? Wringing his hands, looking at the yearly budget, talking with Michael, the archangel, and saying, man, how in the world are we going to advance the kingdom of heaven? If we can't get these people to give, it's not what God's doing. It doesn't need our money. It's not about giving to the Lord, right? Beloved, God is not lack on anything and needs nothing from us. Everything that we experience in this life is for us. It's for us. Let's remember Psalm 24, 1 and 2. We're very familiar with it. The Lord... The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. 
the world and those who dwell in it, for he has founded it, right? He needs nothing. He didn't need money to build it. He didn't need money cashed up to create the universe and speak the stars and the heavens, right, into existence. In Psalm 50, verses 10 through 12, the Lord says, for every beast of the forest is mine, right? Is whose? Is his, right? The cattle on on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains. And everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. Why? <laughs> That's kind of some, some weird rhetoric, right? Right? This is kind of, kind of like the Lord saying, have you forgotten I'm the Lord? If I was hungry, I wouldn't ask you. I'd create the world's largest ribeye, right? Like, I don't need your money. <laughs> I don't need it. The world is mine and all it contains, so why give? God doesn't need it, but he desires to bless the giver in the now, and if done without hypocrisy, also in the eternity. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 says this, there is one who scatters, and uh, I'll pause. We live in Wyoming, so so I think we're a little more aware of, of what the imagery is here, right? But, but uh, the imagery is of a farmer, right, who takes his seed, and, and, the, and the ground has been worked, and it's prepped, right? And he takes his seed in his hand, and, and he begins to scatter that seed, right? He's, he sows that seed. And this is what uh, Proverbs is, is, is saying here. And, and, and we might imagine, just for a moment, may, uh, imagine that there's just one man and one woman left on the earth, and, 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 and they have like uh, just enough seed in their hand, uh, enough wheat maybe, seed in their hand that if they wanted, they could mash it all up and maybe make, maybe make a, a slice of bread before they died, right? Uh, and they really like bread. And, and, but on the other hand, there's just a lot of turkeys running around, and they know that, well, we could eat turkey, right? And, and, and the idea that the, that the sower has to, 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 to kind of imagine for a moment is, well, do I crush up this, this seed right here, this little seed, and do I eat it now? Or, 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 or do I go ahead and, and, and I sow that seed, and I put it in the ground, and then what grows up in place of that seed is a head of grain, right? And, and that head has, has many seeds on it, right? And then next year we could plant more seeds, which would be more food. And this is the idea that, 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 that the writer here uh, um, uh, in Proverbs is saying, there is one who scatters and yet increases all the more, right? If I, if I die to the idea of eating my slice of bread today, this spring will have a field of wheat. We get it, right? This is not hard for us to understand, we, I, I, but I want us to wax on this a little bit and, and take a little time because this is what the principle of giving that we find in the Scripture. There is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results only in want. Who's the second person? The first person says, I'm going to deny uh, 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 I'm going to deny myself. I don't want the piece of bread <laughs> right now. I'm going to just eat turkey until the, until the harvest comes, right? The second person says, no, 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 no. I could never do that. I must hold on to this, these few little, little, little grains and, and then I'm going to consume them. And then when the harvest comes, he looks around and there's nothing to eat. We get the imagery. There's one who scatters, yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due, and yet it results only in want. The generous man, uh, this is typical Hebraism, right? There's another parallel, same teaching. The generous man will be prosperous, right? Notice there, might be prosperous, will be prosperous, the one who sows it, who gives it away, right? Who plants it in the ground, he'll, he'll, he'll be prosperous. It's just, it's simple, right? And we can think of John 12, I think oftentimes with Nathan, one of his favorite verses, right? That, 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 it, that if a man were to die and go into the earth, Jesus, and come back, right? That much fruit would come from that. It's all the imagery of farming. Consider 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Makes sense, right? Put one seed in, get one head, one kernel, right? One, one head. He who sows bountifully will also 
reap bountifully. Beloved, why give? Not because God needs your money, but there is blessing in giving, both in how God naturally has has worked the world and what he supernaturally does in our lives. There's a blessing. He will do it. Who is to give? Christians. What are they to give? Money. Where to they give? Where are they to give? The local church. When are to they, they to give? On the Lord's day. And why are they giving? Because God promises to bless the giver. And now the final question: how are we to give? 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 pulls it all together. Paul wrote, Now this I say. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. Right? Why? Why not grudgingly? Why not under compulsion? Because God loves a cheerful giver. The Greek word behind our English word cheerful there in the text is hilaros. Uh, It's where we get our English word hilarious. And so you've probably heard that preached before that that God loves a a hilarious giver, right? Somebody who is cheerful in his giving. Why? Because they know, they they get the principle. If I I give, the Lord blesses. And it's pretty easy to be cheerful about that. Now, if you've not disciplined yourself to give, the whole thing is I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to hold on to it. And you've not seen how God has, uh, has honored his promise to give back. You don't have to live the Christian life long and give for very long before you begin to realize how God gives back to us. Can I say a few more things? It's going to cause us to go a little long and the kids are doing good. No parents are ready to throw. I just want to encourage you with a story that that Valerie and I uh, experienced a number of years ago. We were young, young Christians and we had a business at the time and, and we had done our best to to plan for our tax season, and we thought that we were going to have to write this $10,000 check to the IRS, and so we had set that thing aside, and, uh, and we had gone to a leadership conference this was a number of years ago in Kansas City, and, and um, there was a missionary there getting ready to go out on mission, and, and um, the Lord just made it very, very clear to us to take that $10,000 and give it to that missionary. And we were both sitting there, and, and you know, I, I, I'm an engineer-minded kind of guy. You guys can probably recognize that. And I'm thinking, okay, now how are we going to pay our debt <laughs> to the IRS, right? And Val came to the same conclusion, no, we're supposed to, we're supposed to give. We, we just need to give it. I don't know how that's going to work out. I don't know what it's going to be. And, and there was a lot of fear, and I was literally physically sweating, like, young person, kind of young in business, like that's a lot of money for us. And, and, uh, and so we just did it. We decided to do it. We, we wrote the check and, and, and then just, just hated the idea of April 15th coming, right? <laughs> when, when we knew that we'd have to pay the pipers, like, well, this is going to be horrible. Now, listen, I don't know how the Lord will work in your life and how how it all worked, and I didn't know, and I probably, if I had a better accountant, they could have told me, don't worry, just give it away, but, but we didn't know that, and, uh, and, and so we gave that, and we came to the end of all our meeting with our accountant and all this, and dealing with the business and, and the things that you do, and, and he's like, well, it looks like you're going to get $1,200 back, <laughs> and we're just flabbergasted. <laughs> it's like, how did that work? And I asked, how did that work? And he said, well, your charitable giving was so high that it offset everything, and you're going to get some of this money back. And, and I thought, man, like, what a blessing, right? In that moment, in that time, we were obedient. And listen, here, beloved, that does not happen every time. It doesn't mean God would make it happen every time. But for us and our walk, and when, when, when we walked in obedience right there, uh, God knew how that, that was going to work out, and we celebrate. Now, had it not worked out, and they said, well, gosh, looks like you're going to owe $12,000, and we said, well, we have a dollar in the bank, you know, we just said, what's the payment plan? And we'd have been okay with that because we were convinced that we knew we were supposed to give. Are you tracking with me? All right? He, God doesn't have to do anything for us. Let us live another second Give us another piece of clothes or another uh, paycheck ever. 
We don't deserve any of that, right? But yet here is this, this principle in the text, right? Give and receive. Press down, shaken together, running over. It's going to take some faith, right? How do we be hilarious? How do we laugh when we begin to experience God's blessing? How, how when we walk in faith and we see how God provides, we are those who can be cheerful givers. I'm always reminded of Habakkuk, uh, who, that minor prophet, and, and one of my favorite chapters and what has helped me form my worship as it pertains to giving and life and getting and blessing. Uh, Habakkuk comes back there, I think it's in chapter 3, and he has this wonderful prayer, and it essentially goes something like this. If there is no bleeding in the stalls, no bleeding of sheep, but there's no sheep in the stalls, there's no figs on the trees, yet I will worship you, right? That's our attitude. I don't deserve anything. Yet we look at the text and it's like, give and receive. Wow. And then you do it and you go, wow. And then the next time you give, you're like, this is cool, right? And you're, now you're a hilarious giver, right? <laughs> Are you with me? All right. So that was like a five-minute Diversion. Now we're back. All right? That's how we become cheerful givers. And Paul answers that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 through 11. How do we be hilarious givers? We're right there in that same text we've been in, 2 Corinthians 9. God is able to make all grace abound to you. Just pause for a second. The word grace, right? Charis, it's, you could translate it gift. You could say, God is able to make all gifts abound to you. <laughs> How can we be cheerful givers? He can make all things abound to us, right? So that always having all sufficiency, right? Don't worry about it. We're going to get to that in chapter six, right? Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear, right? The world worries about those things. Your God loves you. So that all always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed as it is written. So why would God give it to you? And why would he make hilarious? So you can turn right around and do another good deed with it. Make sense? Just plant that seed, man. Don't get fearful. Just put it in the dirt. I promise it's coming back, right? And it goes on to, to uh, in verse 9, as it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. Right? Why is he going to do it? Not so you can stick it in the bank, right? He gives you more and then you can sow more and more comes back, right? Share the gospel, share the gospel, plant the seed, plant the seed, plant the seed, right? More comes back, more comes back. Multiply your seed for sowing and increases the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality. So, beloved, our text starts with recognizing every Christian will give, saying, when you give. Who gives? The Christ follower. What do we give? Money. Where do we give? The church. When do we give? Each Lord's Day. Why do we give? Uh, uh, why do we give? Because God blesses the giver. And how are Christians to give? as we purpose in our hearts, because God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? Now, we're not even to the text yet. Are you excited about that? I got to hurry. But I do only have a page left of notes. So, Mom, just hold on. We're going to get there. So here it is in our text. Uh, now, as I mentioned a little bit ago, there are basically two kinds of giving found in the New Testament. Both are offerings. One, as we just studied, is given to the church. The other uh, uh, is, uh, is going to be personal and individual giving to the poor. So we're out, of, uh, we're out now of the corporate church setting, right? And we're into an individual setting. Um, when I was about uh, 24 years old, I, I, I went to Mexico on this missions uh, trip. And um, the missions trip was really just to plan another missions trip. 
And so it was a little bit scouting. It was getting to know the missionary. And, and uh, we were in a little uh, old, old town called San Luis Potosi. And, and anyway, we were planning on doing this outreach out in the city center, which is a big deal in those, in those old towns. Everybody comes to the city center to buy and, 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 and things like that. And then so, of course, do those who are poor and, and who are begging. And, and uh, we were going down there to take a look at where we wanted to, to do this outreach and um, um, while we were walking along, a, a man, very poor man, came up to me, and I was really uncomfortable because I'm a weird white dude from Wyoming, right? And 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 I and I don't know what to do with myself, and and I've never had anybody ask anything from me because I'm from this affluent town in Laramie, and there's no beggars because you'd freeze to death in Wyoming, in Laramie, right? And so new situation, and 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 he asks, uh, he asks, you know, for money. I didn't speak Spanish, but the missionary was there with me. And, um, and I thought I would just kind of like go away uncomfortably, you know? <laughs> it's, I, was, I don't know if I had a plan, but that's probably what my plan would have been. And, uh, um, but the missionary stopped me. He, he just physically got in my way, and he said, you give to that man, right? You give to him. And I appreciated that opportunity uh, as I learned and grew in my scriptures uh, that uh, the, the idea is when we give to the poor. And he was teaching me something. He was mentoring me in a, in a way that in this principle that, that God is going to take care of you. This man is in need. And if you got a dollar, you can give him a dollar, right? It's not every day somebody's asking you for that, but right now he is. So we need to remember, Jesus does not say if you give to the poor, but rather when we give to the poor. Remember from a couple of weeks ago, we said that it is incumbent upon us not to be foolish with what God has entrusted us. While we are to give to the poor, we must also discern the time to do so. If, if we gave to every person who asked of us, right, we would be poor with them. We, we mentioned that a few weeks back in Matthew chapter 5. Remember that in the last days of Jesus' life, it was proper for Mary to use a whole bottle of expensive perfume to anoint Jesus rather to, to, than to sell the bottle and give it to the poor. As Jesus said in Mark 14, 7, for you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish... You can do good to them, but you do not always have me. In other words, there's a stewardship to the things that we have and, and when we give, and, and we understand that the poor are always going to be around. They're going to be, but, but we've got to decide uh, as, as God gives us opportunity and as we pray uh, when and where we're going to give. And notice this is not the responsibility, uh, or, or, or this is not just giving to a responsible poor person, Right? Um, that often happens, right? People end up homeless very, uh, just out of wild circumstances that we can't imagine sometimes. Maybe some of you have been through that. Or, or we're not to give to just Christian poor people, right? Like God, as Matthew 5.45 says, who makes the sun and the rain come upon both the righteous and the unrighteous, we, his children, should always be ready to give to the poor, right? They are made, why? They are made in the image of God. Amen? And when we do... Here we are, I'm finishing up. <coughs> Do not sound a trumpet before you. In other words, don't tell everyone what you're doing, as the hypocrites do uh, in the synagogues and the streets. It's not hard for us to know who these hypocrites are. They're the scribes and Pharisees from chapter 5, verse 20. And why were they letting everyone know what they were giving to the poor? So that they may be honored by men. And it comes back to our principle that we learned last week. It should remind us, right, to, to look back to verse 1 and uh, 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 the definition of hypocrite here, uh, which quite literally means a stage actor, somebody who puts a mask on, right, and acts. And Jesus defines them as practicing their righteousness in verse 1. Uh, before humanity or mankind, right, men, anthropos, we study, to be noticed by them. And remember that verb to be noticed was theomai, right? And where we get our English word theater. And notice it is not as if God does not reward the stage actor. He does. As a matter of fact, a hypocrite usually attains to their earthly reward. Most often, hypocrites look and sound so good to our natural senses, don't they? Sometimes they are at the top of their class in school or, or college or whatever. They are often the funniest people. They're sometimes voted most likely to succeed. And so often they seem to rise to the top in any kind of environment, right? Because they, 
They are, they are gifted and able to wear all the, that gifting on their sleeves. And if that's you, I just encourage you, be careful. Don't play the hypocrite. And here, if they're giving to the poor for personal attention, Jesus says, truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. That is, in this life, they have it, right? The praise of people is all that the stage actor gets, right? Everybody stands up and, and you go home and forget what the stage actor did. Jesus says in verse 3, when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may, your giving may be in secret. We get the idea, don't we? Whatever it takes, beware not to lose both physical and eternal reward by playing the stage actor, seeking to please others. But beloved, whether we are giving to the church or giving to the poor, let's make sure that our giving is done in such a way, right, that our Father who sees us do it in secret will reward us. Beloved, Jesus knows that when Christians give, we're going to be tempted to tell others about it. Who here has experienced that? I have. I have. Let us always remember that giving righteously yields divine rewards, both in the here and now and in eternity. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the patience of your people to get through this little bit longer of a, of a sermon that we might uh, be well reminded, Lord, that you are so gracious to us, that we deserve nothing, yet you give and you give and you give to us. Lord, help us to be faithful uh, in our giving and, and uh, Lord, not that we just give to get, but, but Lord, that, that we give, it, that we might be a light to a world that might ask, why in the world would you give? And then we are always ready, Lord. Help us to always be ready to share the story of how you gave to us, uh, Lord, your son, when we did not deserve it. Lord, this principle of giving is uh, such an amazing principle that we can live and be joyous and cheerful.